Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you're having an amazing day and thanks so much for joining me for another art video. In today's tutorial, I'm gonna be taking you through my full painting process for this pink rose painting that I created using watercolor pencils. For this realistic watercolor pencil rose study, I used a total of seven different colors from my Gold Faber Aqua watercolor pencil set from Faber Castell. I'm gonna let you know exactly which colors it is that I used in just a bit. I used four different layers to develop more of a realistic look and I'm gonna be walking you through everything from how I select my colors, the watercolor pencil techniques that I like using, as well as the main things that I always like doing along the way that will help me arrive at the outcome that I like. I'm gonna make sure to leave a link to a watercolor pencil 101 uh, little class that I created for beginners getting started with this medium in which I explain a bunch of basic information and what makes watercolor pencils different from watercolor paint and so much more that is going to be left down below for you in the description box in case you'd like to go and check it out before jumping into this tutorial. All right, so the very first thing that I like doing after having prepared my pencil sketch on my watercolor sheet which by the way, I always make sure that my pencil sketch is nice and light so that that pencil work doesn't show through my paint and that pigment at the end. Sometimes I do my sketch freehand right on my watercolor sheet and other times I do my sketch on a separate sheet of drawing paper and I transfer it over onto my watercolor paper using tracing paper or another transferring method. But once my pencil sketch is ready on my watercolor sheet, it is time to get started with pre-selecting my colors. And usually I use a reference photo. For this study, I found a beautiful pink rose photo over at unsplash.com that was taken by photographer Joshua Hone. So with this photo open on my computer screen, I started taking out from my watercolor pencil set a few different reds and a few different greens that I thought would lead to great results based on the colors and the values that I was seeing in the photo. Because I was going for higher levels of realism with this study, I knew that I had to set myself up for success by pre-selecting a few different reds and a few different greens that would allow me to easily develop a wide range of values, from very light lights to a wide range of midtones to very dark darks. Whenever we're going for higher levels of realism and we want to create a sense of 3D-ness and depth in whatever it is that we're drawing or painting, value or the lightness to darkness of our different colors is really number one. So you have to make sure that when you are selecting your colors, you have that development of different values in mind. So when I was pre-selecting my reds and my greens, I had that in mind. I went in and pre-selected a light pink, then a kind of medium red and a darker red. And also, as you can see, as I'm swatching out these colors right here, one of my reds is warmer. It goes more towards the orange side of the color wheel. And my other red, the darker red, is cooler. It goes more towards the purple. So I not only had a very light pink, a medium red, and a darker red, but I also brought in a variety of color temperatures so that I can have a nice play with color temperature, especially throughout the petal area of the flower. And then for my greens, right here, you can see me swatching out my greens as well. I'm activating all of these colors with a paintbrush and just a little bit of water because I like actually activating my color when it comes to working with watercolor pencil. So it's always um, a smart thing to go ahead and when you're doing your swatching for the colors that you're gonna be using to do, you're activating with water as well because this will help you just understand what the color will look like when you actually activate it with water, if this is a technique that you'll be using. But anyway, as you can see with the greens, I did the same thing. I made sure to select a lighter green, 
a medium green and a darker green. And when I was swatching out my greens, I didn't really like the second one and I decided to change it for another one. So I took that one out and then I decided that the one that I initially thought was gonna be the darkest green was actually going to be my medium green and I brought in an even darker green. So I took the green that I didn't want out, I brought a new darker green in so that I had at least three different greens, lighter green, medium green, and darker green. And then in just a bit, I decided to bring in an even darker red, which is gonna be more of a wine color, like a reddish purple that I'm going to be using to really push the darkest dark areas within the petal section of the flower. I do my best to keep my number of colors to a minimum and really limit my amount of colors that I use to only what I absolutely think is gonna be necessary for me to arrive at the outcome that I want. I hope that by me sharing all of this and how I pre-select my colors, you're getting an understanding of how important it is to take time to set yourself up for success for the painting process. Doing just a little bit of planning in terms of choosing your colors and being just aware of how you're gonna be developing your different values really goes a long way. By taking time to pre-select your colors, there's much more of a chance that you're gonna arrive at results that you like and also that the process is gonna go much more smoothly. Just picking random colors along the way makes it a lot more likely that you're gonna accidentally create colors that you didn't want. And also the greater amount of colors it is that you start using, it's just gonna be more overwhelming and confusing. When it comes time to reaching out for a color you need throughout any given point in the painting process. So keep things simple when you can, less is often more. All right, so here is the list of the seven specific colors that I decided to choose for this piece. As I said, these are all from my Derwent Gold Faber Aqua set, and they are 130 Dark Flesh, 118 Scarlet Red, 126 Carmine Permanent, 133 Magenta, 170 May Green, 167 Permanent Green Olive, and 173 olive green yellowish. Even though I am providing the list of the specific colors that I am going to be using, don't feel that it is necessary for you to use these exact same colors. I am a huge proponent for using what I have and encouraging other people to use what they have. So whatever it is that you have with the information that I just shared with you before in terms of how it's important to set yourself up for success and just prepare uh, different pinks and reds and greens are going to enable you to develop different value areas. Choose colors from your own set or what you have available that you feel is going to help you do just that. And finally, before moving forward, if you're interested in knowing the paintbrush that I'm gonna be using to activate my layers of color, I'm gonna be using a size six round brush from Windsor and Newton's Cotman line watercolor paintbrushes. Some artists enjoy using those barrel fillable uh, paintbrushes that you can fill up with water when it comes to activating watercolor pencil color. However, I find those a little bit clunky. The bristles are super stiff and they don't absorb too much water in them and I just don't like them very much. So I'm just gonna use one of my watercolor round brushes that I use with my regular watercolor paint. All right, so with everything set and ready to go, it's time to get started with the painting process. So just like when I am painting with regular traditional watercolor paint, I work from light to dark, okay? So I go in initially with my lightest color of the bunch, which in this case is the lightest pink that I selected for myself. I am going in with a very small amount of pressure. I'm really not pressing down very hard at all, nor will I press down with any of my subsequent colors very hard at all until maybe the very last part of this painting process. And even at the end, I wouldn't really call it burnishing. I just go in with a bit more pressure and that's it. But I'm going in with this color. I'm trying to apply it using strokes that are going towards the same direction or keeping those strokes consistent in terms of the angle that I chose so that things will start looking messy. And as you can see, just like when I'm working with regular traditional watercolor paint, I am keeping certain sections of lightest light values free of pigment. 
okay? Because when I am working with watercolor, whether it's with traditional paint or pencils, I am incorporating the whiteness and the brightness of the paper under that paint because it's gonna stand in place for my highlights. And so I want those very lightest areas to have little to no pigment in them at the end. And it's very important to plan for highlight areas and keep them protected throughout the painting process. Because if you don't have lightest light areas in your highlights, you're gonna flatten out your painting. Remember that in order for something to look realistic, you need your lightest lights or your highlights, you need a wide range of midtones, and you need your darkest darks. This is why when working with watercolor, we don't really need to bring in any white paint or color at all because we're incorporating that whiteness of the paper underneath as part of the piece. It's standing in place for our highlights. And so as I am going about creating this first layer of color, I am really noticing those very light areas in that reference photo and trying to keep them free of color. And you don't have to be extremely precise about having those highlight shapes exactly the same as in the photo, as long as they are similar in terms of size and shape and location, your painting is still gonna end up looking pretty realistic. But pay attention to the reference photo and really train yourself to observe the different value areas and shapes present in that reference photo. Notice the lightest areas, notice the areas of midtones, and notice the darkest dark areas because if you're not able to pinpoint these in your reference photo, then how are you gonna make them happen in your painting? All right, so I was done applying my initial layer of my lightest color, which is the pink. And with that in there, it was time to start layering my second color on top. So this is the first lightest red. Again, I am incrementally, gradually making my way towards my darkest red color. And with that pink already laid down and my highlight areas uh, mapped out for me, so to speak, because I left them free of color, I am going in with my next darkest red and I am adding in this color only on the darker midtone areas that I am looking to darken further on top of that pink. And in the lightest areas in which I just want pure pink with that lightest color, I'm not adding in any of the second color at all. I just want that pink to be left alone, um, completely shining through with none of the second darker color on top. All right, so I'm finishing up with the second red here. And after this one, it's gonna be time to move on to my third darker red. And the darker and darker I get with my colors, the smaller the shapes that I am coloring in are because I'm only looking to darken certain sections further. And I'm leaving those previous lighter colors completely uncovered and shining through in all of the lighter value sections, the lightest lights and the lighter midtones. I'm leaving just with the previous lighter colors. So in other words, another way to see this is only the very darkest midtones and darkest dark areas are the ones where that uh, pigment is layered heavily. In the lightest midtones and the lightest lights, there is a very small amount of pigment going on. All right, so I'm doing a little bit more work with this third red, and then you're gonna see me go back to my lightest color, my pink, just to layer a little bit more color before activating all of this with water. So even though, generally speaking, I'm making my way from lighter colors to darker colors, I do go back from time to time to the lighter colors to work on transitions between lighter values and darker values, as well as maybe layer a little tiny bit more color in areas that I feel I need to do a little bit more layering before getting started with my first activation of color with my paintbrush and my water. I try to make sure that I have enough color already layered on my paper and that I have a good variety of values developed and there's already a, an understanding of where my lightest lights are going to be, where my midtones are going to be, and where my darkest stars are going to be before starting to do my first activation with water. 
even though throughout this process I have been layering my different my pink and then my reds and you could see these as being layers of color really I like acknowledging all of this work that I am doing as my initial layer and then I'm going to do my activation of this initial layer of color allow everything to dry and then the next layering of color that I do I regard as the second layer and then I do my activation with water then I allow that to dry and so on and so forth so in other words every single time I activate my color I see that as one single layer okay so I'm happy with how everything is looking so far so at this point I've only used the pink and two of the next darker reds after the pink I have not brought in my darkest red I will do that for my next layer, okay? The next application of color, I will be bringing in my darkest red, the reddish purple. Okay, so once I was ready, what I am doing right here using my size six round brush is I am taking a little bit of water at a time from my container of water. You really don't need very much water at all when you're working with watercolor pencils but still it's important that you start developing your water control. And this is why for me, just like when I'm working with regular watercolor paint, it is very important to have an absorbent towel on hand. You can see how I am constantly dabbing the tip of my paintbrush, the bristles of my paintbrush on my absorbent towel, just to make sure that I am A, not bringing out way too much water onto my paper, and also B, when you're working with watercolor pencil, it's very, very important that when you're activating your color, that you're staying very mindful as to how you're pulling and pushing that pigment around your paper. So what I like doing is I start in the lightest value areas. So in this case where I've placed just my pink, I start there and then I gently drag my paintbrush into the darker areas because this way it's a lot less likely that you're going to start pulling the darker colors into your lighter value areas that you don't want to darken. So start in the lighter value areas and make your way towards the darker value areas and along the way continue paying attention to how you're moving that color around as you're activating it. Because if you stop looking at your reference photo, you stop acknowledging the different lighter, mid-tone and darker value areas and you just start uh, mindlessly pulling that color everywhere, you're gonna start flattening areas out. It's very important that along the way when you're doing your activation, you continue looking at the reference photo and continue acknowledging the different value areas. Whenever you see you're pulling way too much pigment into lighter value areas, swivel your paintbrush in your container of water, remove that pigment, and then continue with just a teeny tiny amount of water on your paintbrush and continue on with your activation. But pay attention to how you're moving your paintbrush around and how much paint you're pulling or pushing into your different value areas. Notice how often I am removing the color from my paintbrush bristles, dabbing my bristles on my absorbent towel and going back in. This is because as soon as I notice that I'm starting to pull pigment into areas that are lighter or where I don't want that pigment to be, I am removing that color from my paintbrush bristles and I am going back in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush and just softening edges or continuing with my activation of color. To make this process less overwhelming, I would recommend working petal by petal. And if possible, what I like doing is opening that reference photo in Photoshop and zooming into certain areas. Because especially when you're working on an object like this, in which you have many different petals which are overlapping on top of each other, it can be very easy to get lost. You start losing a little bit of patience, you start working faster, you stop looking at your reference photo, all of a sudden you've covered up your highlight areas and you flatten things out and things like that. So be patient, take it a step at a time. And if you find you start getting tired, I would recommend taking a break and coming back to it later with a fresh set of eyes. And of course, more patience, which patience is really something that's completely necessary 
to create great art, especially when you're going for higher levels of realism, which is definitely more time consuming and more kind of detail based. All right, so I was done with that first activation of color and it was time to get started with my initial layering in the stem and the little leaves around the petal area. So I'm starting my work with the greens. Once again, starting with the lightest green and making my way incrementally towards the darkest green. You can see how I'm leaving little shapes that I am not coloring in. These are little highlight sections, lightest light areas that I want to leave free of color. All right, so I finished up with my lightest green. I am switching on over to my medium green and I am only darkening certain sections of darker midtones within these lighter green, larger shapes that I want to push darker values in. And once I'm done with this medium green, I'm gonna switch on over to my darkest green that I selected for this piece. And I am going to only darken smaller shapes within the second color, the mid-tone green. This is the darkest green here. And you're gonna notice that I primarily focus on the shadow sections in the stem and also little uh, darker value sections in the leaves and that I'm leaving the previous lighter greens shining through from underneath in the lighter green midtones and lighter green areas that I want to leave free of this darker green. Once I'm done with this green, I notice that there is a little hint of pink and red in the stem and these little leaves around the petal area. So I decided to bring in a little bit of the pink and I really like how adding in this pink really helps integrate everything together. And I'm just placing the pink in sections where I see that pink in the reference photo. And then just like with what I did with the petals, I go back to the lightest green to make sure I have a good amount of pigment laid down before doing my activation of color. And of course, if I want to work on any transitions, I can do that before bringing in my paintbrush and my little bit of water again. All right, so I'm, I'm doing the exact same thing here that I was doing for the petals. I'm bringing out a little bit of water at a time and I am really helping myself with my absorbent towel to make sure that I'm not bringing out way too much water from my container onto my paper and also to make sure that I am staying in control when it comes to pushing that pigment around. I am continuing to observe that reference photo along the way and I am continuing to really pay attention to the different value sections. I want the darkest greens to stay in the darkest value areas. I want the medium greens to stay in the medium green areas. And I want the lightest green areas and the highlights to be kept either free of color or with a very small amount of color in them. While I'm working on these green sections, of course, the petal area is drying. It's very important that before we go in and work on our second layering of pigment in the petal area, that everything is completely dry there. Because what's important to remember is that wet paper is fragile paper. And we need to allow that paper to dry and regain its strength before we go back in and attempt to darken certain areas and add more detail, etc. After having done my activation in that first layering of color in the green areas, it was time to move on to working on the second layering of color in the petal area. And I made sure that everything was completely dry before going in. The objective with the second layering of color is to only darken darkest areas. So I'm gonna focus on the darker mid-tone areas and on really pushing those darkest dark areas. And so for this next layer, I am really starting with the second red. So I'm not really doing any more work with my pink anymore. I'm jumping straight into my second red and then I'm making my way towards the darkest red. So in other words, I am using my three darker reds that I have selected for the petal area, making my way from the lightest red towards the darkest red. As I am darkening these areas with my darker reds, I make sure to release the pressure as I am doing those strokes, as I am moving into lighter value areas, just start gently releasing that pressure that you're exerting on your pencil, which 
By the way, as I said before, I'm not pressing down very hard at all, but still, in order to create those gradients into lighter value areas, make sure that you're releasing that pressure as you're moving into those lighter value areas. I do my best to stay away from layering any more color in lighter value sections. So wherever I perceive lighter values to be in that reference photo, I am doing my best to not add any more pigment in those areas. I'm continuing to compare my piece with the reference photo. I do notice that in these two petals in the back, they have pretty dark midtone values in a very large portion of them. So I do allow myself to go in and darken large portions in those petals. But in most of the other petals where I perceive there are uh, majority lighter values. I just focus on darkening those smaller dark value shapes. In my reference photo, I notice where those overlapping petals are creating a shadow on each other. I'm also noticing the structure of the petals in and of themselves. So how they curve and how the different sections of these different petals are catching more light or less light because of how they are curving. With realism, it really is all about capturing that subtlety. Um, and something that's also super key with realism is staying away from the look of outlines, because with realism, what we're trying to develop are edges, not outlines. Edges are sections in which one value meets another value. Sometimes the difference between one value and the value beside it is very subtle, and other times it's very obvious. And you have to get great at deciphering using your reference photos, noticing where the change between your values is gradual and soft, and when the change is like a very obvious sharp step in which one very dark value turns into a very light value. With realism, there is always a combination of soft gradual transitions between values and also those sharper steps between your values. But there is never, ever, ever an outline in between your different value areas or your different parts of your subject. That is something that's gonna lead to flatness and more of a cartoony coloring book page look. What you're trying to create with realism are edges, right? Not outlines. And so for me, I really like acknowledging my different value areas as abstract, irregular shapes. All right, so this is me going in with my darkest reddish purple color. And as you can see, I am focusing on using this darkest red only in the very small darkest sections where I'm really looking to push darkest dark values. And once I was done with that, it was time to get started with the second activation of color. Same as with the first activation, I am making sure to bring out just a little bit of water at a time from my container. And I am focusing on only activating that color that I just placed with my second layering of color. I'm barely going into lightest value sections at all. And if I do, it's just with a very, very small amount of color and pigment in my paintbrush bristles, sometimes just a little bit of water, and it's primarily to work on transitions and creating a gradual uh, transition between the darker values and the lighter values. And same as with the first activation of color, I'm always paying attention to how much color I am dragging around or pushing around my paper and noticing the different value areas in my reference photo. I don't want to darken areas that don't need to be darkened. And again, I want to remind you, if you want more control, make sure that you're starting with the lighter portions and then make your way towards the darker portions instead of starting in the dark ones and pulling all of that darker pigment into lighter value areas. And whenever you feel that you're pulling way too much color out into lighter value sections, just remove that color from your paintbrush bristles and go back in with just a tiny amount of water in your paintbrush and continue with what you are doing. So throughout this process, if you've been activating your color with me, you've probably noticed how much more vibrant the color looks once it's been activated. Some colors even look darker after they've been activated. 
and also of course how plenty of that texture created with the uh, application of color with pencil it dissolves and kind of melts as you do that activation with your water depending on the quality of your watercolor pencils and also depending on how much you press down along the way when you are laying down that color you may end up with more or less of that pencil kind of sketchy texture so it depends on a bunch of different variables even the type of paper that you're using also has an impact because of course the heavier the texture or tooth your paper has the more your pencil is going to skip over that tooth and that might lead to a greater texture for this one, I made sure to use paper that is hot press. Hot press paper is the smoothest type of watercolor paper and it's the type of paper that I like using when I am gonna be using watercolor pencils. However, even with the smoothest paper and these relatively higher quality watercolor pencils, and even after doing my activation with water, I am still bound to be left with some amount of texture created by these pencils. And I just embrace this uh, more colored pencil kind of texture uh, as part of what the medium allows. All right, so I finished up with that activation of that layering of color that I did in the petal area. And now I am jumping on over to working on the second layering of color in the stem and the leaves. So just like what I did with the petals, I am using primarily my two darker greens. So this is me going in with the uh, medium green and then once I'm done with the medium green and darkening some, some of the darker midtones, I switch on over to my darkest green and I only darken the very darkest areas with this darkest green. I also go in with a bit of one of my darkest reds to further enhance that red look in certain sections of the leaves. And once I'm done with this second layering of color, I go ahead and work on my activation in these green areas. This is the beauty and the magical aspect of watercolor pencils, is that they are both a drawing and a painting medium combined all wrapped up into one. Some artists like using watercolor pencils primarily as a drawing medium and bring in just a teeny tiny bit of water, if any, Others like myself like using plenty of water and doing plenty of activation and there is just a vast degree of um, activation to non-activation kind of uh, processes that you can find depending on who you are kind of learning from. There are so many ways to use watercolor pencils and this is just mine and I would encourage you that after you learn what sets this medium apart from other mediums and the basics, the basic techniques and all the must knows to really not be afraid to explore and experiment on your own until you come up with your own way of using watercolor pencils, especially when it comes to such a versatile medium like this one. All right, so I finished up with my activation in the green sections. And everything was completely dry, by the way. Remember, when you start with a new layering of color, make sure that everything is completely dry. But then it was time to get started with the third layering or application of color. Again, I am starting with the petal area because we're getting into very darkest darks and we're working on pushing darkest value sections at this point. I'm primarily using my two darkest reds at this point. However, if you notice in your painting that you need to work on transitions into lighter value areas a little bit more, or perhaps you have very large, flat, white, or very, very light value sections that you feel you need to work on a little bit more, feel free to go in with your lightest pink. It all depends on how your own painting process is going but do make sure that you're taking the color that you need for that area, taking into account the values that you see in the reference photo. You can see me pushing those darker midtones for those shadows created in between the overlapping petals. I'm just areas in that photo that I notice need to be darkened a little bit more. And in just a bit, I'm gonna grab my pink and I'm gonna go into these super, super light little shapes 
in these innermost petals. Right now they look a little bit too flat to me, like the entire shape in those innermost petals, those very, very light shapes right in the center of the petal area. They look like they have one flat same value all throughout. And I wanna go in and at least develop somewhat of a, you know, a couple of, of different very, very light pink values instead of having one flat value all throughout. Even at this point, I am not pushing down very hard at all because I don't wanna scratch or damage my watercolor paper. All right, so I'm pretty happy with how everything is looking in the petal area and I don't wanna start overworking things or start laying down way too much pigment in my lightest light areas. So what I am doing here is I jumped on over to doing the third layering of color very quickly in the leaves and the stem before activating everything because I'm gonna do that relatively quick as I am just focusing on pushing very darkest value areas. Okay, so that's all done. So it's time to move on to my third and final activation of color here using my paintbrush and a little bit of water. Everything that I've mentioned so far with my previous activations with water applies here. You wanna make sure that you're going in with just a small amount of water in your paintbrush. Make sure that you're staying on top of water control and help yourself with your absorbent towel or your regular kitchen paper towel, whatever it is that you're using, and pay attention to those value sections in your reference photo so that you're not pulling out pigment into lighter value areas where you really don't want to darken anymore. Hopefully throughout this process, you've noticed how much value matters. Developing a wide range of values is key for creating that sensation of 3D form and realism. Throughout this process, I've kept lighter value areas protected and I've continued to push via layering um, so that I can widen the amount of values that I've developed because it's through having lightest lights, having a wide range of midtones, and having your darkest dark areas, that this rose really starts to pop out of the page. You start perceiving that 3D look. All right, so I did that final activation of color in the petal area and the stem and the leaves. And finally, this is the very last layer of color, the very last application that I'm gonna be doing here. This last layer, I am not going to be activating with water because I actually like to leave these final little pushing of darkest dark sections with a bit of that colored pencil texture. So for this very last application of color, I am using just my darkest red, my reddish purple, and just my darkest green in the green sections. And I am just working on carving out those darkest dark sections and also maybe defining some edges here and there. Maybe at this point I am allowing myself to push down a little bit more, but I'm still making sure not to press down so much that I start scratching or burnishing my paper. Less is more in this part of the painting process and I'm really just jumping around the entire piece and allowing myself to be a little bit more loose and maybe even expressive at this point that I am trying to bring in a little bit more of that texture and line work and the mark making techniques that pencils allow. When it comes to working with this medium, I really like at least bringing in some amount of that texture and the mark making that the pencils allow and bring it together with the more painterly techniques that they also offer. And with that, we are all done with today's watercolor pencil pink rose study. Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, please make sure to check out everything that I'm offering over at my Patreon membership website because for a very small amount a month, you get immediate access to my most exclusive resources in the form of real-time, step-by-step, fully narrated tutorials that I don't share anywhere else. All of the tutorials that I share over on Patreon include my downloadable outline sketch, my high-resolution reference photos, and my supply lists, including the list of specific colors that I use for the piece on hand, Patreon community members also have access to my weekly sketchbook prompts, which are designed to help you stay consistent and making progress as an artist. 
There's also a library of classes on art fundamentals that now has over 20 classes in it and that gets added to each and every month. Monthly live Q&A sessions with me in which community members get to ask me anything they'd like feedback from me on your work, and much, much more. So go ahead and check it out. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things. So you can pick whichever one you need. I'm gonna make sure to leave a link to that down below in the description box. All right, you guys, that is gonna do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please, make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.